On this edition of Independent Sources, Women at Work, how quotas are changing the profile of political and diplomatic leaders in Europe. Under siege, holding offenders accountable for sexual crimes against women in war zones. And making the grade, a CUNY alum returns to help a flagging community college in the Bronx. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. And I'm Viano Ravinka. German Chancellor Angela Merkel and the head of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, have been two of the most visible women in the world as leaders have sought solutions to Greece's economic crisis. They're only two of the growing legions of female leaders from Europe who are poised to make their marks on politics, diplomacy, and business on the continent. As I found out in my conversation with Romania's UN Ambassador Simona Miculescu and CUNY Professor Joyce Gelb, quotas are one practice that's been used over the years to promote female leadership in Europe. Thank you both for being in studio with us today. Dr. Gelb, I'd like to start talking with you about the success of the Nordic countries in uh, ensuring uh, a high number of women in political office through the system that they have in place, uh, the, the quota system. If you could please uh, explain what that is. and Okay, well first of all they don't all have a quota system uh, or they don't have a quota system that is nationally mandated. Some of them have quota systems uh, that are done through the party and some of them don't have them at all. So it's a combination of factors um, that I think have affected women's role. They may have special measures of some sort or another for women. For example, they may provide special funding. They may encourage the nomination of women uh, in, uh, in particular districts. Uh, but the yeah. Nordic countries yeah. are, are definitely uh, a case um, that stands out where mm -hmm. women have overwhelming uh, in, in overwhelming numbers, they they have seats in uh, political offices. Yes, and, yes. and explain what's wow. what's making uh, that happen. Well, I think part of it does have to do with these special efforts that you have referred to by either the national legislation, national legislatures, or uh, specific measures that have been adopted by the parties. For example, in Sweden, it was the Social Democratic Party that adopted a quota or special measure system, then it was picked up by the more right-wing parties. So frequently left parties have been the source of this kind of uh, empowerment of women, but not always. So one factor has been the kind of party system, uh, the model that has been established. I think this has been very important uh, efforts to really push women in, uh, in the political system. I also think that the more egalitarian political cultures of the Nordic countries have been a factor. Uh, there's been an emphasis on equality, gender equality, socioeconomic equality in these countries, and I think that has been a factor also in promoting women in political office. So I think that this is, uh, this is, this is another issue. I think women uh, in these countries to some degree have been encouraged both to work and be uh, caregivers, and so they have had a balance to some extent in terms of their political roles. It hasn't been entirely successful because a lot of women work part-time. But still, uh, I think the notion that women should have a, an important social role has been established uh, in, uh, in most of these countries to varying, uh, to varying degrees. Um, if we want to Add to this, Norway, for example, earlier when it had a female head of government, um, also pushed for a policy to have at least 40 percent of all uh, elected offices be held by uh, by both genders. So mm -hmm. that's a kind of variation on a quota system, but again, it had an important impact on the election of women to office. Let me uh, change the discussion um, and talk about uh, 
Ambassador Simona Miculescu, who is the first Romanian woman to hold the rank of ambassador. Uh, tell us the importance of that for you personally and what barriers have you encountered? You can imagine that for me it's actually a great honor um, when I found out that I'm the first ever. I didn't know if I should be happy or sad because to have that only in 2002, this meant a lot of discrimination for women before me. Um, actually, before the Romanian Revolution in 1989, women couldn't be diplomats in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They could have only careers of executive assistants. That's it. Although Romania, if I may uh, interrupt, um, um, stands next to the Nordic countries in the 1980s as uh, the other successful model, countries where a system of quota was implemented and the number of women in office during communism was, was uh, pretty high also. Although, that was it was based reported, on... reported, mm -hmm. and that was actually, it was about women that belonged to the Communist mm -hmm. Party, to the superior echelons of the party. So it was not, you cannot compare the two systems, because it's the, system, the difference between a democratic system where women uh, go up uh, upon personal merits and women who are actually selected on political This is criteria. very interesting. So this is uh, the, the perspective from the inside, what the reality actually uh, was, and a lot of those uh, uh, offices that uh, women were holding were based on kinship um, and, and family ties to the political party, you're saying. Exactly. But I have good news. Actually, we, we managed to catch up after the revolution. So I have to say that now in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for instance, because we were talking about this example, I think that more than 55 percent of the career diplomats are women. So we tried to compensate. And I have to say that they are very talented and they, 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 they achieve a lot. Um, but of course, there are challenges. And I'm very glad that uh, 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 Madam Professor highlighted the importance of the political culture. Because, at least in my country, there is a very interesting uh, social phenomenon and political phenomenon that happens, has been happening. Um, we have what we call the Elena Ceausescu syndrome. Uh, your audience might not know what this means. During the communist times, Nicolae Ceausescu's dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu's wife, Elena Ceausescu, is considered to have been the evil, actually, and even worse than the dictator. So, uh, after the revolution, when women thought of, you know, asserting themselves and being in front as leaders in our society, Nobody trusted them because before the revolution, like during 25 years, there was only one woman who was an illiterate, but, act but actually she was a member of the academy, who was the star, but she was a fake star. So she eroded the trust in the, in the profile of the woman leader for many, many years to come. I have to say that women were pretty shy in the first 10, 15 years after the revolution. Um, we catch up slowly, but we catch up. We don't have a, a spectacular percentage in the parliament. We have only 10% of women, but we catch up in the private business. I, I think that this is very interesting because I just saw in a, in a study, a recent study, that Romania places on the eighth place in the top of, uh, of the number of the women top executives in the business. We don't have sector. much uh, time left, unfortunately, sure. but quickly, if you could uh, also talk about an important aspect in this uh, discussion. How's the media uh, treating uh, women leaders uh, in, in, in Romania? And then I can toss it to Dr. Gelb for uh, a wider assessment of what's going on in, in Europe with the media and women leaders. You have such good questions which require <laughs> long answers because they are very complex. Well, I would say that it's a, uh, that it's a mixture. You know very well that, unfortunately, sensationalism affects a lot uh, media all over the world, and unfortunately, Rene is not excluded. So there are sometimes uh, temptations to highlight the frivolous portrait of the woman politician, characterizing her upon the brand of her purse, but not upon the programs that she comes with. Uh, but on the other hand, I have to say that if women um, are even more 
confident and uh, try to assert themselves more in the society is also due to the media because there were all sorts of tops of the most successful women in Romania made by, especially by the business magazines who are very, very serious in Romania and um, they, they promote the healthy profile of, of women leaders. So um, there are ups and downs, but we are very grateful anyway. And Dr. Gelb, uh, just in a, in a few words, what are the challenges that uh, women uh, um, face when it comes to the way that uh, they're portrayed by the media? Well, know? I think it really depends on the person, um, the role, um, and again, the kind of media, how intrusive they are. Of course, there you know there are media that are only interested in selling papers or sensationalizing you know political issues, um, and they do focus on what women are wearing and how they look. Um, but I think, especially in systems, some of which we've discussed today, that take women seriously um, as politicians and view them as equal members of society, one hopes. That that uh, the emphasis will be on their policies, their programs, their accomplishments, and not so much uh, on the way that they appear uh, and uh, the clothes they wear. Thank you both for being in studio with us today. Ambassador Simona Miculescu and Dr. Joyce Gelb, thank you again for being in studio with us today. Thank you thank for you inviting so us. Still to come on Independent Sources, what's being done to end the sexual abuse of women during wars. Before that, Abby Shola has some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. From Voices of New York, reports published by Carib News and News India Times present conflicting views on how immigration laws affect the Indian and Caribbean communities. A proposed bill called H.R. 3012 Fairness for High-Skilled Immigrants Act of 2011 would eliminate the cap on how many employment-based green cards would be awarded by the U.S. yearly. Carib News published a report with many sources saying the law would favor Indian and Chinese migrants and lead to a decrease in the amount of visas awarded to Caribbean nations. Meanwhile, News India Times reported that many Indians are unfairly being denied a different work visa called L-1B which requires specialized knowledge to work in the United States. From LDRO La Prenza, working immigrants are facing few options for childcare. LDRO reports that less than half of the over 200,000 four-year-old children in New York State have access to early education and childcare. Cuts in the state and municipal budgets have affected funding for daycare centers and public preschools in New York City, forcing many to close down. From the Amsterdam News, a new report shows that students of color are being targeted by police in schools. Out of 300 school arrests, more than 90% of the students were black or Latino. Many of the arrests were described as minor offenses. The data comes courtesy of the Student Safety Act that requires the NYPD to submit quarterly reports on arrest to city council. And finally, a 72-year-old Nepalese man says he is the shortest man in the world. Chadra Bahadur Dangi says he's 22 inches tall, about the size of a toddler. The Guinness Book of World Records is set to travel to Nepal to measure Dangi to see if he can claim the title. A man from the Philippines is currently recognized as the world's shortest man at 23.5 inches tall. That from the Filipino reporter. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to Gary and Vianora in the studio. Thanks, Abby. Centuries ago, St. Augustine described rape during wartime as an ancient and customary evil. That was 1,600 years ago, and sadly, it's still true today. The historical numbers are startling. Nearly 2 million rapes during World War II and an estimated 500,000 during the Rwandan genocide. Rape is so prevalent in many conflicts that the UN Security Council recently called it a tool of war. Several scholars say it's used strategically as a means of humiliating and terrorizing a people. Even as reporting on the issue has improved, advocates fighting to end this blight say there is still much to be done. I spoke with Yasmin Hassan of the women's rights group Equality Now and Lauren Wolf of the Women Under Siege Project about the issue of rape during wartime. Yasmin, rape in war is as old as war itself. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this whole issues getting as much attention nowadays? 
Well, I mean, really, it's been in the last two decades that this has been an issue. And I would give credit to the women's rights movement. Uh, Equality Now, which is what I belong to, we were formed in 1992. And at that time, we saw that international community really didn't give any uh, you know, priority to women's rights at all. They were seen as national issues. Everything in war that happened to men were war crimes. What happened to women was men will be men or boys will be boys. Um, so really, the reason we started Equality Now was to change that focus and to say, and so I think women's rights communities and later on joined by the human rights community have done a lot of work to get rape be recognized as a weapon of war. And you know, the UN has done a lot. There's a lot of international jurisprudence on this. There are now Security Council resolutions and so on. And But the impetus for, for all this really, I think, came from the women's rights movement. Lauren, what do you think? What else is contributing to this awareness? Well, I've actually noticed a real movement toward talking about rape and sexualized mm -hmm. violence in the mm -hmm. last year or so. It, it's right. really come to, to a fore. Um, a lot of the work I did at the Committee to Protect Journalists was about sexual violence in journalists. Mm -hmm. And you've heard a lot about that since Lara right. Logan right. and Lindsay right. Adario. And also with the Peace Corps, there was a whole movement against rape in the, you know, in the Peace Corps and that whole right. process of right. finding justice. I, I think Yasmina's right. The women's movement has done a lot to bring this out, but I also feel that women, uh, average women, are really saying we don't want to take this anymore. I'm just, it's just a gut yeah. feeling I'm getting. The UN has been proactive in this, and it has a mission right. to uh, stop it. So can you talk to us a little bit more about that, Yasmin? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, what we do at Equality Now is we try to actually prevent like violence against women from happening, and then when it happens, have better measures to address it. You know, going forward. So we want to make sure laws are in place; they are implemented. Now, when conflict happens, those are all wiped out. There's no justice system. There's no national government that you can go to for accountability. So what redress do we have? We have to go to international bodies, right? So the UN is in the forefront of this. The international community has to address this issue as an international issue because it's very difficult to address it as a, as a national. At, at the national level. And I think a lot, a lot, if you look in the last two decades, a lot has happened in that sense. But so there's a lot of rhetoric. There's a lot of resolutions passed. There's a lot of cases that have great decisions. But what does it mean for the women on the ground? This continues to happen. If you see DRC and the recent conflicts, it's getting worse and worse. Uh, so we really have to. You mean the democratic in, in Congo? In the Congo, oh, okay. yes, yeah, yeah. So sorry about that. Uh, so we really have to think much more actively about solutions, right? Implementation. I think very, very key is focusing on ending impunity by any means, because what happens in the aftermath of this uh, of the conflict, if it is not addressed, not only can the victim not move forward, uh, a whole culture of, of rape and impunity is created. And you see this in the Congo right now, other countries. Whereas at the same time, there is also, it's, it's a con aftermath of conflict is also a time for positive change. So if you see Rwanda, Liberia, they have re-examined their legal systems, their laws in place now are much better. So and that's part of the international community came in, they helped those countries rebuild. And again, things are not perfect, but I think that we really need to focus, number one, on prevention, right? And prevent by prevention, I mean, look at the status of women in community before the conflict actually happens. Now, why is it that somebody can rape a woman and feel that this will destroy the whole community? That has so I say something of status of women in that community. So prevention, and then if this happens, redress. Redress can, yeah. It's, there's a couple of conflicts that come to mind, uh, El Salvador, Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. where rape was not used as a tool for, in Sri Lanka, it was because of religious uh, reasons. And Where rape was used as a Was tool. not. I would argue that there is no known conflict right now in the world mm -hmm. or in the last hundred years we can point to where sexualized violence has not been used yeah. as a tool of war. My project, um, Women Under Siege at the Women's Media Center, was founded by Gloria Steinem. And the impetus for founding it was based on her reading a book about rape in the Holocaust. And you know, you would assume that that's a very non-controversial mm -hmm. subject. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a horrible subject, but you would just mm -hmm. think people were killed, it was a genocide, there yeah. was rape, as yeah. in any genocide. But this is a history that's been suppressed yeah. uh, for many reasons. You know, in, in the Holocaust, people don't want to look to women's suffering necessarily. They mm -hmm. say, you know, an entire people suffered, many people suffered mm -hmm. in the Holocaust. Yeah. Yeah. So women's stories really fell by the wayside. There's also a tremendous stigma and shame when a woman has been raped, not just mm -hmm. for her, but for her family. So the story just goes untold. So when Gloria read that, she was really moved to say, if we had known this, could we have prevented Bosnia, Rwanda, Congo, any yeah. of that? Yeah. Um, and 
just interestingly recently to pick up on what Yasmin said about impunity, I agree completely. Part of what we're doing at Women Under Siege mm -hmm. is really examining the culture that creates rape specific to each country. Right. And like you said, how do you stop this mm -hmm. from happening? You have to really understand how it's being used as a tool of war. And from there, we're looking at legal remedies. And a really interesting case just happened um, at the end of mm -hmm. January in Guatemala. The former president, um, Efrain Rios Montt, was finally indicted on war crimes charges. Mm -hmm. And that was back from, from crimes he carried out in 1983, basically. Mm -hmm. um, 200,000 people died in the uh, Guatemalan genocide, and 100,000 women are estimated to have been raped. First of all, the world doesn't really know this. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, there's been no redress. And I was in Guatemala a few weeks ago um, with a delegation from the Nobel Women's Initiative, mm -hmm. and it was a group of women. We were traveling through Honduras, Mexico, and Guatemala, meeting with women on the ground, hearing their stories. And women told me who were old enough to remember the genocide and their own rape. It's very hard for them to discuss, but they would tell me about their daughters now being raped mm -hmm. uh, because the same conditions are still mm -hmm. existing. Well, to Gloria's point, I mean, what has been done. Well, that's exactly it. Very little has. Mm -hmm. And that's why, as you were saying, ending impunity is so crucial. So this arrest of this former president is bringing hope, finally. And also hearing women's voices, like mm -hmm. as, as Lauren just pointed out, like hearing their voices, what they have to say. Mm -hmm. Because so often women who've been, uh, you know, subjected to sexual violence are silenced not only by themselves, by their communities, by their nations and all that. Hearing their voices is therapeutic. It, it put, shines a light on, the, on what happened. And then having those voices influence policy going forward, right? Yes. That's what some of the UN things like. It is essential in peace building or in addressing the two have women involved in decision making. Let me ask this question. It's been sort of like hanging there. Who are the biggest perpetrators? Are we talking about regular armies or militias? Is there a difference? Or? It's both. both. And, and that's one thing yeah. I'm trying to figure out right now. In each conflict, I like to really you know, break it down, is it the state perpetrating it, like in Rwanda where mm -hmm. there was a mass propaganda campaign against mm -hmm. Tutsi women as yeah. horrors and they should be raped and killed, right. you know, right. inciting the people. And in Guatemala, I'm looking at was it state ordered back in the early 80s. Yeah. Um, but so often, yeah. as in DRC, it's so many different militias and there are so many reasons they're raping. I mean, it's fascinating. They're raping because they believe that it gives them power on the battlefield to rape a woman mm -hmm. in some cases. And then it's it's compounded by UN peacekeepers. <laughs> that's the well, other that's thing, right? So the part, yeah, yeah, in, in everywhere, right? So in DRC and all the in Sudan, uh, it is compounded by that. And the UN is looking at that issue right now. But I feel that it's the saddest thing is like people who are meant to be part of the solution when they add to the problem, right? Beyond so, passing <laughs> resolutions, what can the UN do? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, part of it is, I mean, they have to be much more stringent with peacekeepers that go on the ground mm -hmm. as the conflict is happening, not only internal guidelines so the peacekeepers don't abuse, but that the peacekeepers have to take this seriously and try to put an end to it, right? So it has to be a priority, number one. Secondly, for those peacekeepers who have contributed to it, there must be justice, must be swift, mm -hmm. it must be immediate, and, you know, it must have some, uh, you know, what do you call it, uh, the resonance, right? So that there's, uh, thirdly, I think the UN has to involve women much more mm -hmm. in the rebuilding, right? There have been resolutions saying women must participate in the rebuilding of state process. I have yet to see it properly being well, implemented in and Liberia, made a reality. perhaps. Liberia yes, is maybe the is only example, example where women really exactly. were crucial in ending the war yeah. and in building the peace. Right. So no wonder they elected a woman president. Well, yeah. She, yeah. Crucial. yeah. One final question that I have on this is, what's the trend? Is it decreasing or is it augmenting? Uh, the number of rapes. rapes. yeah, across the world. I mean, we can uh, state mm. the simple mm -hmm. number that yeah. uh, 400,000 women are estimated right now to be raped in Congo every year. And that's from a, a very well done study yeah. recently in May. With that number alone, and then adding just, up what's yeah. going on from Syria to Libya to Egypt, mm -hmm. down through Colombia, Guatemala, mm -hmm. and you know, yeah. Latin America, yeah. across Burma, it's so uh, massive. It's, there's no way to really put your finger on a number, and that's what's crucial for people to know right, right. now, that this is a human rights crisis. Sure. This is a crisis for women. Thank you very much. Yasmin Hassan, Lauren Wolf, thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you. When we come back, a troubled CUNY campus gets some help from one of its own.
do your part. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank today. Finally from us tonight, Bronx Community College ranks at the bottom in almost every academic category in the CUNY system. Last summer, CUNY officials called on a distinguished alum to turn the trouble school around. The new president, Carol Barod Joseph, is a graduate of York College. She intends to emphasize teaching and forging partnerships with the business community to help turn things around at BCC. I sat down recently with Dr. Joseph to get a sense of the depth of the challenges facing the college and her plans to address them. <laughs> Carol Barod Joseph is no novice when it comes to the challenges of educating community college students. But last summer, Dr. Joseph was in for a surprise when she began her tenure as the president of Bronx Community College. 85% of our students come with remedial needs. 85% with at least one remedial need. Um, there are some that come with two remedial needs. You know, they're weak in reading, in math, in writing, and they're at the lowest level, so which means then we have to, they have to do two or three remedials before they even get to a college level. And the first thing to notice is this button right Undaunted here. by these challenges, start. Dr. Joseph has set up priorities in hiring professors who are committed to teaching and tackling the shortcomings of the students who are coming out of the low-performing New York City high schools. So as soon as I got here in the summer, we had committees meeting. Once faculty got back, we looked at the different areas. We know we needed to look at what we do with freshmen first-year students, we really don't have a good program for first-year students. So they come, they take classes, and 50% and of them are not passing their first-year classes. Well, right there, each year you're going to have more attrition and you're losing more and more students. They get discouraged, they're going to leave. So we're focusing on the first year. Dr. Joseph is no stranger to the CUNY system, having been a member of the first graduating class at York College in 1971. She worked at CUNY after completing her Ph.D. and rose to become vice president of Hostos Community College. She spent five years as president of Dutchess Community College and held the presidency at Mass Bay Community College in Wesley Hills, Massachusetts, before returning home to lead the Bronx campus. What brought you back to New York City, to CUNY? The fact that most of my family is still here, most of my friends, colleagues I worked with, both in the New York City public school system as well as CUNY, and um, other colleges, you know, was attractive to me. The opportunity to work at a large institution was also appealing. The enrollment here is about 11,500, and that's the credit side of the house. We also do workforce development and continuing education. And, um, you know, that appealed to me because it was a larger, um, you know, uh, business basically to manage because a college is a business. But the fact that Bronx was also, um, within CUNY, one of the colleges that really needed a lot of work and a lot of support in terms of student outcomes. That challenge appealed to me. After turning around the troubled Mass Bay Community College, leading Bronx Community College seems like a perfect next step. Our graduation rates are low. We are the lowest in the CUNY system among the community colleges. and. Um, and I feel community colleges are still the open access, the door for students to have an opportunity to be able to get to college. But I also am very committed to the fact that we need to give them what they need if we accept them. So we can't continue to have a revolving door where we're recruiting students every year and most of them are not you know, completing or graduating. Five years from now, how would you measure success? Well, definitely um, improvement in student completion rates, the fact that students are able to complete courses more successfully, that they are better prepared, and that they're eventually graduating and transferring or getting jobs in their fields. For Independent Sources, I'm Gary Pierre-Pierre. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded. <laughs>